Sejua Akanayaka, it has been way, way too long since we got together for Indie Scene. Indie Scene is back as of tonight. Uh, I am thrilled to uh, to welcome you back and um, to talk about a, a fascinating film, uh, a couple of fascinating films, one that we actually watched and we're going to discuss. The other is uh, in development right now. And one of the reasons we have not spoken uh, or at least done a show in about six months. So without further, further ado, we are going to get into uh, the Secret Society for Slow Romance 2 Cosmic Disco Detective Renee. And That's also good. Chetsumoka's Curse from the movie uh, from the year 2000, which is part of the Dogma 95 movement, which I don't believe I've ever actually watched a Dogma 95 film. I didn't really understand what Dogma 95 was until this morning mm -hmm. uh, before I watched Chetsumoka's Curse. But uh, we're going to get into all of it. First of all, Sajiro, how you doing? Pretty good. Extremely indie episode. You know, history of indie film, current unknown indie filmmakers. But yeah, uh, good over here. It's taking uh, forever as usual to finish the script, but we're getting there. <laughs> I shot uh, about three hours of uh, B-roll, which is something that I do for my movies, already for the movie, including some stuff with the actors. They are eagerly awaiting the script, the pages, and uh, we're going to shoot in October, November. Hopefully by the start of the next year, the movie will be done. Uh, Cosmic Disco Detective Renee. It'll be very entertaining. One of the, some of the influences are Pulp Fiction, Monk, Seinfeld, Werewolf Ninja Philosopher, Slow Romance One, uh, and my <laughs> usual things. I'm recovering from a cold cough or whatever, so excuse the coughs. Um, yeah, hopefully you'll be able to see it in uh, December or January. That's awesome. Um, so you've been, yeah, like I mentioned, you've been hard at work working on various facets of this for the last you know, half a year. Like, mm -hmm. how are things going? Like, have you been just kind of obsessed with with getting this done? I mean, it's a lot of like preparation. Is this mm -hmm. going to be uh, how is this film going to be different than the, the works you've done before? Well, the, one of the <laughs> one of the reasons uh, I've been busy uh, is because I wanted to make it uh, a lot different uh, than Slow Romance 1. If someone were watching both movies on the same night, they'd get two different experiences. Uh, Slow Romance 1 was uh, just people sitting around and talking, and, you know, a plot happens, you know, we get updates on it. Uh, Slow Romance 2 will be a little bit like that, but like, a, you know... <laughs> 50 times more stuff will happen uh, because in Slow Romance 2, uh, we get to find out that Rene is an unusual detective. He can hear the background sound, sound of the universe, which sounds like disco. So that's where the title comes from. And focusing on that sound allows him to help solve problems. And just like were the werewolf character, uh, he gets clues from everyday interactions, dreams, memories, talking to people, just looking around, wandering around, you know. And uh, so, and like Breakthrough Weekend, we have some cases to solve. Um, yeah, three cases pretty much. Largely a conversation-based comedy, but it's faster. We get out of the apartment, <laughs> the apartment sets quite a bit. And... Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't seen the final how it all comes together, but I have a really rough idea now. And I'm finishing up the script, and that's where things are. A lot of work. And uh, the other thing is planning out distribution and marketing. Uh, I had some success with Slow Romance 1, but I'm going to do that on a much bigger scale on this uh, with this upcoming movie. And you know, things are in a different place, generally, just in the world than when you made the first uh, Slow Romance um you had i know you had kind of uh, tweaked the story and just the overall idea of what that movie could be with uh, covid and, and the pandemic times now that we're sort of coming out of it does that does that influence the the story that you wanted to make, tell the kind of story and also the have you had some limits removed from you as far as like what you imagine you're going to be able to shoot and you know access to places and just like kind of sheer scope yeah, it's uh, back to like regular uh, 
micro budget indie filmmaking in New York. Um, this one has four actors. So that's something we couldn't do last time. Um, so the <coughs> scope is already bigger. I'm still kind of limited by what we set up in Slow Romance 1. So I didn't want I didn't want it to be like Star Trek all of a sudden, right? I want to be uh, I want to feel like this is part two post COVID with more possibilities, but it's not a gigantic difference. It's a significant difference, but not like an entirely different world. So I wanted that connection to be there. It's largely a conversation based movie. Uh, but this is faster, funnier, and a lot more going on. I mean, a lot more going on just in the universe of the, of the movie with time travelers, immortal people, you know, lots of mysteries to solve. And you're always working on, like, coming up with ideas for a billion other projects, right? So right. have the, the, the following movies kind of been mapped out? Are you having to splinter off ideas into other scripts now or like say, I'm going to no, th those are notes for, for the next one. Um, or do you have a pretty clear vision of like a delineation? Like this is going to be the next movie. And then, you know, very clearly I'm going to do these other ones are going to be something else entirely. Well, since we're going up to a very high entertainment level, hopefully like the Pulp Fiction, Seinfeld, Monk type level, the ones after this one would have to kind of be at that level, I think, to, you know, keep, to keep people happy. So um, the next few probably will be heavily influenced by Cosmic Disco Detective Renee, how it's put together and what it contains. And then down the road, I might come up with a story that's in a sort of entirely different vibe, entirely different universe, still in New York, but, uh, you know, different kind of influences. So there's a few that I want to do next year that are going to be heavily influenced by uh, the Cosmic Disco or Detective Renee universe. Okay. And, you know, we wouldn't have a Cosmic Disco Renee if we didn't have a Slow Romance 1. So That's how right. is that? how's that gone in the, in the year of Slow Romance 2022? Still going, and it's going to go into 2023. As I promote the new movie, I'm sure people will check out the first one. Uh <clears throat> Something like uh, 11,000 plus people have seen it and uh, I'm not promoting it a lot right now. I'm just focused on making the current movie. So uh, yeah, it's it's going well. I learned a lot from it, uh, got a lot of feedback and uh, it's led to the second movie. So as goes in the indie film world, I mean, you're not an independently wealthy you know, or head of a, of a major studio. So I imagine you're going to need some uh, assistance, perhaps getting funds together. Uh, any plans for, uh, I guess, crowdfunding Cosmic Disco Renee? Yes, uh, good question. <laughs> That's coming up. I hope to do a 60-day fundraiser uh, launching at some point in October once the script work is, the current script work is done. Goal is to raise 6000 on the low end, uh, largely to help with distribution and 30,000 on the high end, uh, which will cover a lot of production and distribution related expenses. So I'll post about that on my Twitter, uh, which is at Sujiwa Fantastic, and uh, I'll tag you and then you can share the information. Definitely, yeah. And I'll post it for those watching in the future. Once we have that information, I'll put it down below so uh, awesome. folks will know how to chip in. Um, so what else is going on in, in the the world of the, the indie scene as you see it? Um, Tambio Benson has a fundraiser happening uh, for a film platform called Akaroko, focusing on uh, African films. There's information on it on my Twitter, at Sajua Fantastic. Uh, there's a revolution happening in Iran, and uh, our friend uh, filmmaker Amir Matla has uh, some Iranian home movie footage in his movie Three Worlds, which is on Tubi now. And uh, I've built a couple of websites for uh, Slow Romance. Two, one is called CosmicRenee.com. The other one is called NYCIndieFilmmaker.com. The second one will have a lot of uh, uh, you know information about my movies, the new Renee movie, and also lots of blog posts about just history of indie film in New York, which is vast which a lot of people just don't know about because it's, it's not covered really uh, on a regular basis on a national level. Uh, Slow Romance 2 coming soon. Hopefully by January, it'll be ready to go. Wrapping up the script. 
I think uh, that's about it. All right, cool. Let's talk about then Chetsumoka's Curse, uh, perhaps one of the indiest of indie films that we've talked about. Um, I know Rick Schmidt is the uh, is credited as uh, the creator of the film. Um, before we jumped on, uh, started recording officially, you had mentioned that he was influential in getting a lot of independent filmmakers into uh, making movies, including Kevin Smith, including yourself, uh, including Vin Diesel, mm -hmm. uh, of all people. And he was, uh, this film is signed as part of the, uh, being part of the Dogma 95 movement. So before we talk about the film itself, which is fascinating and a pure amazement to me, let's talk about a bit of the history. Let's talk about Rick Schmidt first, and then what exactly Dogma 95 is. So who is Rick Schmidt, Sajua? Got it. So <laughs> Rick Schmidt is an influential indie uh, filmmaker and author. <laughs> he did a movie, he did a book called uh, Feature Filmmaking at Used Car Prices that came out in the late 80s. So that influenced a lot of current filmmakers, uh, indie and Hollywood filmmakers, uh, such as uh, Kevin Smith, Wynn Diesel's mom got him the book and Wynn Diesel has quotes out on the web saying, and also on some uh, uh, talk shows he talked about it, uh, saying that, uh, that that really helped him focus and pursue his uh, acting and filmmaking work. And uh, yeah, he's influenced a lot of people and his books are still being read. Uh, I'm mentioned in one of the one of the uh, recent editions of his book. He, uh, he did a later version called Extreme DV at Used Car Prices. Uh, I, I connected with them over the internet uh, many years ago, I guess early 2000s maybe, and uh, and Rick's written some nice things about my movies. And uh, anyway, I've done interviews with him. Uh, so that's Rick Schmidt. Uh, he is not really well known in the mainstream world or even in the mainstream indie world, but he's well known and influential in the real indie indie film scene. Now he's made about. 25 plus features and uh, his process is to get a few people together make it a workshop project and you saw this card movie and uh, that we're discussing the Chapsamoka's curse uh, the the uh, structure is similar there's interviews there's scenes happening most of it improvised and then he wraps it all up in an interesting way um, so yeah that's Rick Schmidt and his movies. And do you, do you want me to go into Dogma 95? I do. And I, I will read out, as far as I saw on Wikipedia, the 10-point the list, the goals oh. and rules of Dogma 95. But let's talk about the origin. I had heard about this because I was big into what I'll call indie movies back in the 90s. But you know the Kevin Smith, the Tarantino, Robert Rodriguez around the same time as those guys were hitting it big, I started hearing about Dogma 95 and this guy, Lars von Trier, mm -hmm. who, you know, I, I've seen a bunch of his movies in the interim, uh, but I never really dug into Dogma 95 because it frankly sounded scary. It sounded a bit too independent for me, like mm -hmm. as restrictive as budget and sort of themes can be for independent films, because there is, there has been, in some sense, an attitude of like, we're going to be the anti Hollywood, we're going to make sort of real movies that have to do with like real life issues. And so that's going to come with its own set of restrictions, namely like budget and things like that. Uh, Dogma 95 just seemed kind of nuts to me because it strips down like the parameters and they are just kind of guidelines. But if you want to make an actual Dogma 95 film, you are going to be making it's going to be bare bones, like all about the story, the characters, what you have available to you and then just put that out. Um, so, but before we get too far into it, talk about what you know of the origins of Dogma 95. Well, I was around making indie movies when Dogma 95 broke, became famous. I remember reading uh, articles in uh, Washington City Paper in 95, 96, maybe 97, 98, uh, where they talked about the movie, uh, The Celebration, by Thomas Winterberg, I think that's his name. I may be pronouncing it wrong, uh, Danish. I think uh, that's that was one of the first Dogma ninety five movies, maybe the actual first Dogma official Dogma ninety five movie that became famous. And yeah, it was shot using maybe one chip, 
maybe three chip. Uh, this is old technology. This is free HD. They had uh, CCDs, charge couple devices. That was sort of the breakthrough technology that made it possible to make uh, movies on video that were not just not comparatively horrible looking compared to the amazing quality of motion picture film. So uh, Dogma 95 had a major influence on filmmakers, indie and Hollywood, in uh, taking video seriously as a production format, which 20 some years later, video is now the mainstream production format for movies and TV worldwide. So Dogma 95, a uh, couple of filmmakers, uh, Lars von Trier, Thomas Winterberg, and others signed a manifesto saying, uh, we're going to make movies in a simple way. It completely reset the game for lots of indie filmmakers and foreign filmmakers. Kind of like French New Wave did the same thing. They stripped it down. They said, we're going to shoot on live location, locations, shoot on portable cameras. So this was just like the French New Wave type approach to uh, film make, indie filmmaking or filmmaking outside the industries, but in the, the happened you know in the mid '90s and to the early 2000s uh, and beyond. So that was the movement, and you can someone can go on uh, Wikipedia and on the web and research it. I think they officially ran till 2005 or so, and uh, there's lots of movies, 20 maybe more, probably a lot more really. Uh, I've seen a whole bunch of them, and I've liked a lot of them. Dogma 95 also influenced uh, a U.S. indie filmmaking movement called, or a production project called Indigent in New York, and they made maybe 12 movies, including Tadpole with Sigourney Weaver, uh, Pieces of April with Katie Holmes, and a few other movies that are worth watching. I think the first movie directed by Ethan Hawke was a part of that series. The plan there was $100,000 budget, shoot on digital video. And then both of those movements influenced Mumblecore, which is uh, from mid 2005, from like 2005 or so. And that's largely shooting on digital video improvised. And those filmmakers have gone on to some of those filmmakers like uh, Greta Gerwig has uh, gone on to become well-known people in the film world. Also the other thing that, uh, other two, two other things that help with the transform transformation from video production to film production was Star Wars. I think the second prequel was shot on, uh, you know, a relatively low quality digital video camera. And uh, then Che, which I went to go see with Tambio Benson in 2008, uh, the movie by Soderbergh, that was shot on, I think that was the first, one of the first 1080p uh, movies shot on the red camera. And after that, uh, that was 2008, really. After, even by that point, the uh, digital video was becoming accepted. Soon as 1080p became, uh, which, is, which is HD, which is still being used, as soon as that format became available, then, you know, that was the last days of uh, shooting on motion picture film. And yeah, I know there's been, um, I watched a documentary I want to say it was by Keanu Reeves a number of years ago, uh, interviewing kind of high profile directors, kind of defending the the use of film versus uh, mm -hmm. digital and, and all that. I don't remember the name of the doc, but it was it was fascinating. I this is a fascinating seeing that Sorry, title. Go ahead. I remember seeing that title. Yeah, it was it was good from what I remember. I, I may have even reviewed it on the site. I can't recall. But um, I want to talk about you had said that in the early to mid nineties, you were making films, you were an independent filmmaker already when Dogma 95 hit. Is there in your mind or even in your work or your perception of your work, a pre Dogma 95 mindset versus a post Dogma 95 mindset? What did it mean to you as a filmmaker when this kind of movement began? It was a great thing. Shooting on 16 millimeter is terrible. Shooting on film is terrible. It requires an army that, large cost of filmmaking up to that point, uh, significantly, especially for indie filmmakers. Uh, I mean, you need 20,000, 30,000, $40,000 to, uh, you know, properly shoot a 16 millimeter movie just to get the gear, the lighting, uh, <coughs> the film stock, the processing, the editing, all that stuff. It's all, it's really nonsense compared to how easy it is now. 
So in 1998, I shot a fiction feature on 16 millimeter that DP has gone on to shoot really big things like um, uh, some Sa Safdie bro <laughs> Brothers movies. But uh, that was the first thing that he shot on film, first feature that he shot from Maryland, uh, a movie called Wild Diner. And it was, a, it was a difficult project because we had uh, enough money for maybe one and a half uh, takes, a uh, ratio of one and a half to one. So any, everything uh, for any scene that ended up in the movie, we were able to shoot it maybe one and a half times, not even two times. So kind of insane. So after that, I was like, oh, video is taken off. So I made a documentary using video. Then the <coughs> next feature I shot, in 2004, starting in 2004, it was using digital video, the same technology, uh, pretty much the same technology as what's being used in uh, uh, Chet Samoka's Curse and a lot of other uh, Dogma 95 and early video features. So did it propel you into digital video or did it yes. kind of give you permission because it was a sort of high profile statement, this manifesto? that you know we're going to use this technology that doesn't have the kind of the prestige of you know classical film and you don't have to spend a whole bunch of money to make a movie you can kind of do it however you need to do however you need to get your film out there you know whatever technology you need uh that it just gives a sense of legitimacy instead of just like oh this was just shot on on video it doesn't have the prestige of something you know highfalutin like film yeah definitely made it more acceptable for professional use uh, you know, up and coming emerging indie filmmakers like me at the time, we can point to Dogma 95 uh, and other video projects that were happening saying it's an acceptable format now. Previously, no one took it seriously in the, in the film world if you shot something on video, which is a shame because uh, uh, Dogma 95 type thing could have happened in the 80s, 90s, uh, before 95, maybe even in the 70s because video technology was around. So a lot of minority female and other filmmakers who may not have had easy access to Hollywood money could have made a lot of fiction feature work using video technology. But, you know, it happened when it happened. Uh, those filmmakers took the possibility of video seriously and then everyone else uh, followed after that. And did you see any, I guess, downsides of Dogma 95? Any and Because it sounds like a positive direction, almost a challenge to filmmakers, like see what you can do within these, you know, what many people might consider very limited parameters. Uh, were there any, I guess, negative effects of that on your work or did you see any in the landscape uh, at the time or was it all just kind of good news? Uh, well, the Im <laughs> image quality was not good until recently, until like 2000. Uh, but <laughs> I shot uh, in 2012, I shot Breakthrough Weekend, which was 720p, which is still not great. So, so 2018, I shot on uh, using uh, 1080p, and that was good using one one inch uh, using a one inch sensor in that camera. So until the, until about 2015, image quality from well, you know, if you had unlimited, if you had a large budget, even back in 2008, you could get a, uh, you know, like Soderbergh did, you could get a 2007 or 2006, you could get, uh, you know, higher the, you know, the latest, you know, cutting edge technology on video cameras and shoot something on video and make it look good. But for actual real indie micro budget filmmakers, it wasn't until like 2013, 15, where cameras were good enough to start matching the image quality possible through motion picture film. Now you can match it. So the downside was image quality. The upside was you could make movies. <laughs> well, it sounds almost like a parallel to uh, special effects in you know big budget films. You look at movie like sci-fi movies from the you know, monster movies from the from the, from the 50s up until the 80s and now like the 90s and, and the 2000s and, and sort of beyond where we are now where everything's <laughs> digital, uh, there's definitely an evolution to it. You can watch something from, you know, 50 years ago and say, oh, that looks so 
dated it's it's puppets it's stop motion and now you know a lot of stuff is digital or at least kind of state of the art practical effects you can see the evolution there but in terms of what has remained popular despite its so-called cheese factor is a lot of things involving story and the quality of the overall production you can see you can track this evolution and you wouldn't have gotten to the state of the art like the avatar 2 you know, right. which is coming out later this year, you wouldn't have gotten there if you didn't have people like, you know, Phil Tippett doing these amazing, you know, puppet model work, you know, 40 plus years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk, uh, before we get into Chet Smoka's Curse, I want to go through the rules of Dogma 95 because these were in my head while I was watching it. And I got to say, right off the bat, I found a, a slight violation, which right. in fairness, at the very end of the film, it said... Something like uh, this film was inspired by the rules of Dogma 95. So it doesn't, I don't think, claim to be a, a dogmatic adherent right. uh, to this layout. But OK, here, here are the 10 points. A, one thing, uh, they received official certification from Dogma 95 people. So it's officially Dogma 95 film number 10, the second American movie to receive that certification. Right. And so what I'm saying is you could get dogma 95 certification i don't know if it's like like going to school and getting a report card like you got there's 10 items you're being graded right, upon right. if you hit seven then yeah. <laughs> then you get the certification um, well, yes. but here was that it's a little flexible yes uh so according to wikipedia here's what i have is the the 10 points for dogma 95 shooting must be done on a location Props and sets must not be brought in. If a particular prop is necessary for the story, a loco location must be chosen where this prop is to be found. The sound must never be back uh, be produced apart from the image or vice versa. Music must not be used unless it occurs where the scene is being shot. The camera must be handheld. Any movement or immobility attainable in the hand is permitted. The film must be in color. Special lighting is not acceptable. If there is too little light for exposure, the scene must be cut or a single lamp attached to the camera. Optical work and filters are forbidden. The film must not contain superficial action such as murders, weapons, etc. must not occur. Temporal and geographical alienation are forbidden. That is to say that the film takes place here and now. Genre movies are not acceptable. The film format must be Academy 35mm, and the director must not be credited. Uh, does that sound all right, or is any of that Wikipedia shenanigans? No, that's 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 those are the original rules. But from the beginning, uh, people weird away from it. Um, they shot on video and printed on thirty-five millimeter for distribution. Eventually, they just shut on video. Okay. And um, also, genres such as comedies, romantic comedies, started being made. Uh, within the Dogma 95 rules uh, and be, and got, became accepted by the Dogma people. Well, speaking of breaking rules, folks might be wondering, you know, hey, I promised that the month of October was going to be strictly genre films. So what the hell are we doing talking about this year 2000? I don't even know if it's micro budget, you know, indie film called Chet Smoka's Curse, which is ostensibly about a bunch of people in like, Washington or Portland or I can't remember where exactly they are uh, having relationship problems. I maintain that this is a horror movie. <laughs> I believe this is a backdoor genre film and it's one of the coolest backdoor genre films I've ever seen. So let's talk about it. Okay. There's a woman named Marie and like most of the characters, because this is, this is a very un-Hollywood type movie where we don't start off knowing who everybody is. I don't think we get the name, the main character's name until like three quarters of the, the way through because someone happens to mention it. Um, but she's uh, kind of very troubled. She's had a lot of troubles with relationships. We open on a sort of uh, confessional, uh, you know, which has become very popular uh, in the art form. Um, of her talking about a trip to Mexico and she met a guy and she tried to connect with him and things kind of fell apart and we catch up with her in present day. Uh, she's got a would be boyfriend, but he's having trouble committing because he wants to go off and have these traveling adventures of his own and not involve her. 
She's got this other guy on the side. She has another another guy on the side. A lot of these things sort of uh, unfold and you're like, wow, this is a much bigger spider web than than I thought was even possible. Uh, but- well, one, one thing uh, to add, I got the impression she might have been kind of like a sex worker, prostitute type person. Uh, and that's how she, not not every relationship, but I think a couple of the relationships, uh, especially the one including uh, the guy at the end, uh, you know, the, <laughs> with the big scene at his house, I think uh, that is that might have been, she might be having sex with people for money. And uh, that's the impression I got. Well, that's that's an interesting dimension. I hadn't actually thought about that until you brought it up. But looking back on it, it makes kind of a lot of sense um, because she has a day job at a hotel in this you know kind of small town. Um, and she cleans the hotel. She's also the desk worker. She doesn't have a whole lot in the way of supervision. But what she does have is access to the hotel rooms. And she has a lot of these sort of afternoon flings with uh, with various people. But the whole idea of the curse, the the title of the film, is there was apparently an Indian chief, uh, you know, Native American chief of the area, who, when the uh, co- uh, colonists came in and and tried to, I guess, if you want to call it, settle the area, uh, mm-hmm. he had said, "If you move here, you will forever be miserable, and if you ever leave here after moving here." You will always want to come back. So it's this idea of an inescapable human misery. And that theme runs throughout the movie. And if you pay attention to all of the characters, even the ones who seem ostensibly happy and well-adjusted, there is an undercurrent of sadness, of a lack of uh ambition almost like a cowardice to face their own destiny what they have in mind for their own lives and what's even more telling and what sealed the deal for me was at the very end in the end credits which to me breaks dogma 95 right um stephen king is quoted as uh, in the special thanks or mentioned in the special thanks and while i was watching the movie i was thinking this is a stephen king story minus the overtly supernatural element I mean, you would have this almost like a needful thing is where you've got all these people in this town kind of living under this curse. And at the end, there's like a confrontation, like the devil shows up and, you know, ha ha ha. Or the ghost of the of Chet Smoka shows up and says this. Yeah, this is all true. And there's like a big bloody special effects battle that doesn't happen. We only see the effects of the curse, including at the very end with the relationship that you alluded to that comes to a boiling head. And then there's a very definite cut. And we do see the passage of time, which, again, may break Dogma 95. I'm not exactly sure. And we see the after effects of that, which goes to prove that despite the character's best efforts to break out of the situation, the curse stays strong. Mm-hmm. Uh, am I reading that right? Did you have that kind of same interpretation or do you have a different take on it? Because I didn't even pick up on the sex worker thing. So I'm curious to find out what you think of the rest of the movie. <laughs> well, I felt like uh, the first 60 minutes are set up and it's done in a, in a way that's not typical of Hollywood movies. Interviews, detail, setting up the world, the relationships and the characters. And I think that all led to the last 20 minutes, which is, um, I mean, this is an old movie, so I will we'll reveal some, some aspects of it, which mm-hmm. is a man being confronted by his mistress, slash girlfriend uh, and his wife in a way that is the first time you watch it it's like dark and sad second time you watch it it's like hilarious it's kind of like a curb your enthusiasm type situation like this idiot got himself into this situation and he's handling it all the wrong way i mean it's there it's absurd and funny maybe one of the funniest scenes that uh, rick schmidt has done or the his type of filmmaking has created that's what i thought and uh, but uh yeah it's uh, it's a lot of sad people but uh, you know some normal people like the lawyer character you know, he has a normal life but you know he's gotten himself involved with this with this lady on the side and uh yeah there's a dark you know there's a dark vibe to the whole movie but it's kind of dark comedy i thought 
and just because of the last 20 minutes were great and it's just just you know almost a screwball comedy type situation it is and even while i was watching it i did get that you know the the lawyer character that you mentioned he is a little bit over the top just in the way that he reacts to this situation i got the feeling he was kind of like paddling in the middle of the ocean just to keep uh, keep his head above water but it is sort of comedic because he uh goes blaming other people when he's clearly you know clearly caught right. um, and then he's going into this situation kind of like wide-eyed and happy like hey i finally getting what i wanted even though if he were to step outside himself for a second look at the situation you realize man you are an idiot and a half yeah, but- and, and, and you get the notion that he's he's you know you see him smiling towards the end but you, you get the notion this is the start of another, you know, misadventure that'll be dark and sad. Um, so there, you know, there is, I mean, the that scene is dark, you know, it's about the end of a, end of a marriage, end of a relationship. And there's a, you know, a child involved and all that. And, uh, but it's also funny. It's so, uh, so I'm, I'm calling it sort of like dark Curb Your Enthusiasm type comedy. Yeah. And to me, I mean, I don't know if it's I was picking up on the the sort of the horror element, almost the existential dread in that if you look at what's going on in each of these characters lives, they can't help but get in each other's way. Mm-hmm. And you almost like if you watch a movie, that's a, that's a big trope uh, in you know dramatic storytelling. But it's not usually every single character. It's one or two that have to solve this problem in order to have the the happy ending, or at least kind of push the plot forward. But even characters that we meet, like the daughter, uh, the the lawyer's daughter, as you mentioned, she's having kind of this crisis about, you know, her parents want her to go to college, you know, out in the in the West Coast, and she wants to go out east, and she's having this whole big dilemma. But knowing the parameters of this curse, you know that even if she leaves, she's going to be kind of drawn back home and that's going to create this this tension. And when her family breaks apart right in front of her eyes, you realize this is adding another bit of complexity to it. Like maybe she won't even go to college. She's going to sort of, I mean, in the the ethos of the mid 90s, like you go to college or else you're not going to be anything. Maybe she, quote unquote, throws her life away because she figures she has to stay home and take care of her mom or, you know, step in for dad or something. And then that could be its own kind of tragic movie. And uh, really... one, one thing I saw visually, the daughter looks a little bit like the uh, lady that is coming in uh, to the 20 something year old lady that's coming in to mess up the uh, family. So like Marie, yes. It almost made me think, is the is the daughter going to end up like this other lady when she gets older because of this situation? That that is one possibility. Uh there's probably another one that I don't really want to get into. Um, mm-hmm. but the first time we meet the family, it is very jarring because we spend 20 minutes or however long it is before we meet them, focused on uh Marie and what's going on with her life. And then all of a sudden, we kind of hard cut to this diner, this breakfast situation where a family is, uh, you know, the dad, the, the lawyer is going through a midlife crisis. He announces that he's quit his job. Um, you know, it's very, uh, you know, American Beauty, which came out like the, the year before the year before this, the kind of like I've quit my job. I'm going to go do whatever I want with my life now that I'm you know approaching middle age. But uh, the daughter, when we first see her, she's probably like 17, 18, I imagine. I thought that that was supposed to be Marie. I'm like, are we watching a flashback here? Is this information we're going to be getting about our main character and then we're going to catch up there later? No, it is a the family, a present day family situation. And we later cut to somehow the lawyer is hanging out outside with Marie. I'm assuming it's like the same day or within that same general time frame. And again, the film doesn't hit you over the head with this is exactly what's happening, who these characters are, what they mean to each other. It's kind of dropping us into these situations and forcing us to figure them out on a human level, which I think was just uh, kind of a brilliant strategy because it is kind of confusing, but it's confusing in the way that if you just met people and they started telling you about their lives and their friends, you'd have to piece this all together because you don't know these people yet. Right. Um, um, but oh, but, go ahead. But no, I was going to say, if this movie was... Uh... <laughs> printed on film and distributed to movie theaters and got uh, 
proper distribution and publicity at the time it came out i think uh, i think a fan base would have uh would have uh you know would have emerged around this movie because uh it's a very interesting indie movie definitely a dogma 95 real indie type movie uh it just it just didn't receive the attention it deserves maybe now through being on your podcast it'll be rediscovered I don't know if this is out. I mean, I know I, I rented it on Vimeo uh, Vimeo this morning. I don't know if there's like a home video release or something, because I mean, I'd love to hear Rick Schmidt like do a commentary or something uh, on this uh, or le learn more about it. Uh, you mentioned, you know, this did not get sort of widespread acclaim or even attention. Uh, Maya Berthoud, if I am pronouncing her name correctly, um, plays Marie. And she just, from that opening shot of the confessional and her telling that story about Mexico, I'm like, why do I not know who this person is? She has that star, not a star quality, not like someone who's, you know, young and attractive and she's destined to like be plucked from indie stardom and become, you know, the blockbuster it girl. Mm -hmm. I mean, as an actress, she just has that presence. Yeah. I'm thinking I, I want to see more of her. I don't know if she's done other things than this, but you know, I certainly I'm interested. No, I don't know about her career or what she's done uh, since uh, that movie, but it'll be interesting to find out. Maybe one day you can interview uh, Rick Schmidt. Uh, <laughs> I mean, like, like I said, he's made a bunch of movies, but uh, some of his early movies got into Sundance uh, and big festivals like that had New York City runs and had some European uh, press, but he his movie is never connected with uh, Kevin Smith type being picked up by Miramax, being blown up worldwide, but which is not necessary. Uh, this is so that's why a lot of people who are outside of indie filmmaking may not know about Rick. But all that could change, you know. Uh, once the movie is made, it could be rediscovered 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the road. Yeah, I mean that's. The other thing, unfortunately, that I was thinking about once I kind of made that Stephen King connection is, and, I, you know, there's a billion movies out there, so maybe someone has done this, but this concept would be perfect for, you know, an updating a horror movie, a town that is cursed with, you know, sadness and despair uh, that people can, it you know, I, I guess Stephen King's It kind of came closest to it, but you know, this movie doesn't have a giant like razor toothed clown, but the the kind of idea is there. I think you could really do something and expand on it. I don't necessarily was, want to see that happen, but I was just sort of surprised that this concept hasn't been, you know, kind of uh, blown up. So one one more thing I want to say about uh, about the idea of the curse is and this is in the third act, I believe at one point. Marie is checking a young couple into the hotel and their main concern is, does it have a king size bed? Because they, you know, are very much young lovebirds. And she, it's interesting because she starts engaging with them on this kind of customer proprietor level. But as the conversation gets deeper, she almost starts narrating her inner thoughts and put in interspersing those with the business of the transaction. And eventually it comes out that these two kids don't have any money. So she says, well, there's other ways that you can pay for this room. And usually that, you know, we've seen sort of that in other films is like a sexual proposition. But in this case, it's something much darker. And she gets them to sort of role play their relationship in real time. You know, tell each other something that you don't like about each other. Tell each other something, you know, a, a big secret. And they, she wants them to break through the facade of young love and get to what she considers to be the poison heart of, I guess, every relationship or every, every relationship she's had at least. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, you see her sort of change and manifest into the curse of this town as lived through the people who, who live there. And you rewind the tape a little bit and you think, oh, these two kids... They wandered into this town because they'd heard great things about it. They are now enveloped in this curse. So they are, in fact, doomed. It's chilling stuff, mm -hmm. I think, worthy of Stephen King. And again, why don't more people know about this movie? Well, uh, you know, uh, Indy, <laughs> one of the things that I've been writing about lately on uh, Twitter is Indy film in America and maybe worldwide, the idea. Uh, came 
20, 30 years before the technology required to implement it. Only now can you go to Best Buy, buy a you know HD camcorder and <clears throat> shoot something that's high quality that can match uh, Hollywood level entertainment and put it on YouTube and you know promote it to billions of you know millions of people. I mean that kind of idea is what people had in mind in the 90s, but you had to go through Miramax, you had to go through Hollywood distribution, you had to go through all the gatekeepers, magazines, newspapers. So a lot of work was done by indie filmmakers using the technology and the publicity distribution processes available back in the day. I mean, even people we know, like, uh, you know, like Amir Madla, he makes very interesting movies. Even, uh, you know, even uh, Owner Tokel, he makes very interesting movies, but they're not household uh, names, even Rick Schmidt, right? Or my stuff. So there's a lot of filmmakers in America and elsewhere who were not properly served by the indie explosion. But going forward, uh, these filmmakers can get the word out through the internet and through podcasts and uh, connect with an audience. Uh, so I think real indie film is only now happening because the technology is only now now available. Yeah, and it's it's great to see. I just am hopeful that this uh, continued attention and, and evolution won't leave some of the pioneers behind as far as, you know, allowing their work to be discovered and appreciated by an even wider audience. Because as I mentioned, I was I was flat out blown away awesome. uh, by this movie and I had no expectation going in and I was describing it to my wife um, for people th this kind of this week I'm sort of dedicating to the offbeat horror movies, things you wouldn't necessarily associate with genre. Mm -hmm. um, I'm talking about, uh, I talked about uh, Coppola's The Virgin Suicides uh, the other day. Um, and then I think this movie is sort of in the same vein. You can watch it on a surface level and be like, oh, this is kind of like a weird, darkly comic movie, but it's got some real, you know, heavy kind of undertones to it that are downright horrific and speak mm -hmm. to, in some ways, a tragedy of the human condition. Um, but you watch... Chetsmoka's Curse, the title aside, this could just be a quirky little indie drama, you mm -hmm. know, like the little confessional style, you know, brief interludes looking at people's lives. There's nothing overtly scary. There's no monsters or people jumping out with knives and things like that, but it does fill you with a dread that, you know, 10 horror movies couldn't even match. So that's one of the things I think is really special and speaks to the untapped potential uh, of this mode of filmmaking because there's people say there's only like five stories out there that you can tell there's, i think there's five million just mm -hmm. because everyone's got a unique perspective a you know unique way of looking at the world and films like this prove that you know idea wrong about the there's no original stories anymore yeah the tone and how an artist uh, filmmaker tells the story will be uh different from filmmaker to filmmaker yeah i mean obviously there's <laughs> thousands of ways movies can be, movie stories can be told. That's why we have an ongoing art form. Uh, if it's just five, then we would have been done with it already. Right. Now, when it comes to Hollywood blockbusters, I think there are three, uh, right. <laughs> three well, story think, archetypes. <laughs> yeah, I think Hollywood blockbusters, kind of the history of that format is kind of over once you have a million Marvel movies it's difficult for me to see how they can top, you know, Marvel, Avatar, Star Wars type things. So I think people will start going back to smaller movies because, uh, you know, like the Westerns, it'll be boring after a while. I mean, you know, it's already boring for a lot of people. Well, I mean, Westerns, are, I, I'll have to disagree a bit on Westerns, but that's yeah, only I mean, because... I mean, the boom and bust cycle that the Westerns uh, went through. Oh, right. Um, cause yeah, I'm just, I'm just sort of in the last few years getting into Westerns and finding that it is a genre that has also a very rich kind of, uh, history of different kinds of stories and not just like, Hey, guy rides into town and there's a right. shootout at the I end. Like yeah. They're, they're awesome. Um, I'm just saying, but... uh, they, they went through a period where they made a ton of Westerns and then no one wanted to see them again. Right. And just like, just like comic book movies now. I mean, right. I don't know what the next flavor is going to be, but, 
uh, we're just about due for something new. Um, maybe a remake of Chet Smoka's Curse by by I'm James sorry. Cameron. No, no, no about, <laughs> about a quality indie filmmaking, even minimalist, simple, experimental type stuff will outlast, uh, in a sense, stuff like um, Marvel movies or any you know big budget uh, blockbuster. I saw recently Breathless, and maybe this is a movie we might want to take take a look at uh, in a future episode, maybe the next episode. Yes. 1960 from Godard, and it's amazing. It's uh, it's still modern, fast, weird characters, and it's kind of it's it kind of has this you know real life horror quality to it because you kind of figure out what you know until the very end. You don't figure out uh, what kind of person this one character is, and it's a very dark, you know, ending. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it, black and white, uh, Godard's first uh, first fiction feature. Um, so you know that that movie is still really good, and it's getting a re re release now because of uh, Godard passed. You know, he died recently, uh, so there's a lot of interest in his work. But that's something we should look at. Let's let's talk about that for next month. Um, I don't. I've heard of Breathless. Correct me if I'm wrong. There was a Richard Gere movie in like yes. the early '80s called Breathless. Was that a remake? Was that, that an actual was, remake of Godard's film? An actual remake, almost. Uh, you know, scene to scene. Uh, <laughs> they just you know set it in America and and made it work for an American cult for the American culture. But yeah, but watch the original and uh, watch a good. Uh, good quality copy of it uh most likely the one you'll rent now will be high quality i think criterion has it or a bunch of other people have it done yeah that'll be that'll be good to to finally be able to check off my list awesome. um, but yeah. before before we go i just want to mention the three ways in which i think as much as i love chet's most mocha's curse i think it barely squeaked into dogma 95 because there are three things that i don't think it kind of matched up to one it does have titles Right. Um, it's it's unconventional in the sense that, you know, we have a black screen and then it cuts to what's very clearly titles on a computer monitor and then it kind of moves into the confessional scene. But we don't really see who is interviewing these people in this film. It's sort of a trope that we would come later to see in like The Office uh, and various kind of reality and found footage kind of movies like who put this all together. It's not important. It's all about the it's just a vehicle for the story, right. which I guess is fair. But I don't think that's dogma necessarily. Right. Right. The other is the time jump, which I kind of mentioned at the very end of the film. Um, and then the last one is there is sort of this music uh, when Marie and her I guess the main boyfriend, the guy who wants to travel at one point, they're kind of frolicking and piggybacking. And we do hear some kind of upbeat, like clippity clop music in the background that almost feels like soundtrack music. It's a tight shot of the two of them. So I don't know if there happened to be like a band playing just off the side, off the screen, mm -hmm. but they sort of redeem or Schmidt, I think redeems the idea in the very last scene where Marie presses play on a boom box. And we hear this great, sad song that closes out the film it doesn't sound like a song that's being played on the soundtrack it sounds as if he actually had the band recording the music like just off screen like in this apartment <laughs> but we just don't see them it's supposed to be on the radio i don't know if that's actually the case but there was something about the the way that the sound quality uh was i don't think it was just that oh we shot this on video and press play at an actual boom box and that's what it sounded like it sounded like live music somehow yeah, and <laughs> my approach uh, in dealing with dogma movies or really any movie that comes out of a movement, the movement is the starting point. And it's interesting that they made an interesting movie that works for audiences. It doesn't necessarily have to be, for me, 100% uh, according to the rules. Are you aware of any films that maybe tried to be dogma 95 but they just they came with they like had like one too many strikes against them <laughs> for, for whatever reason? <laughs> I'm not sure, but a lot of dog movies did end up being genre movies, you know, uh, even sort of modern genres like Julian Donkey Boy is like, you know, weird characters in a miserable town. I saw it a very long time ago. I don't recall all of it. Uh, and uh, Italian for Beginners is 
really a, actually a romantic comedy. So uh, maybe the dogma certifica certification uh, people didn't really take their own rules seriously. They just said, all right, this is close enough. And that's the most Dogma 95 thing you can do. <laughs> that's right. Also, I think you could kind of say Amir's movie, Whale, it has a soundtrack. But a lot of Amir's movies uh, kind of remind me of a uh, little bit of both Dogma and uh, uh, Rick Schmidt movies because they're based uh, sort of documentary-like explorations of uh, real-life people or real real-world characters. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. Well, Sijio, thank you very much for recommending this. I, I don't remember what was the context in which you recommended this film. What what struck you to say, hey, we should we're going to bring back indie scene and we're going to do it with this movie. I think uh, this was one of the many that we uh, <coughs> made a list of back in March or so. You're the one who said, let's do Chetsamoka's Chep Curse this time. I, I agreed to it because I liked the title. Good. <laughs> <laughs> but I just didn't know if there was something that that it had come across your yeah. radar of like, oh, this is something happened recently that reminded me of this movie or or whatever. It's just something that you had wanted to see. Um, no, I wanted to talk about uh, Rick Schmidt's movies and also Dogma 95 in indie scene because those are very, uh, you know, appropriate topics for this this podcast. Definitely. Um, and yeah, I, I appreciate I think this has been one of the most educational uh, in terms of like the broader landscape of the indie scene that we've talked about. Okay, one more thing. Uh, Rick has a bunch of other movies. You can Google it. You can go to Vimeo or Rick Schmidt. You'll see it. And uh, and uh, if I see any good links, I'll send them. Definitely. And I'll, I'll post links to that. And plus the other billion things that we've kind of <laughs> talked about here on the show down in the description. Uh, before we go, anything else you want to say, Sajua? This podcast should have been a book. <laughs> what What does that mean? <laughs> because we covered so many things of yes. uh, 20 some years of indie history. I, I took it to mean you were bored of hearing us talk. You'd rather just read the transcript. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, there's so much that we're touching on, barely touching on, you know, that we can talk about this for 20 hours and not cover everything. Well, there are many Dogma 95 movies, as you mentioned, to left to go. So, and we've got uh, ostensibly, hopefully, many years left of this project yep. uh, if, if we see. don't uh, blow ourselves up. So uh, cool. anyhow... So thank you very much, man. We'll we'll come back next week, uh, next week, next month, and we will talk about Breathless by Godard. Uh, done. I can't wait to to yeah. dig into that with you. So an thanks, man. Movie, an immense movie in the history of cinema. Definitely. All right. Well, thank you much, and uh, yeah, best of luck in the in the movie making biz uh, in between times when we talk to each other, and we'll catch you next month, man. Take care. Great. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye.